Welcome to Auto Chatter. Today's topic is part two of common items today on your car or truck and a little history about their origins. As always, facts, opinions, and speculation will be given. Please like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you know another option of flawed but possibly amusing entertainment awaits. Speaking of which, a public service announcement before I begin. I would like to correct a few boo-boos on part one. I incorrectly stated Henry Leland died by a car starting accident when I meant to say that a friend of his and Charles Kettering did, prompting the development of an electric starter on cars. I mean, yeah, I, I got the friend who died part right, but it came out like Henry Leland managed to pass away and still start Lincoln later on in his life. That's quite a feat. The other one uh, was while I was discussing anti-lock brakes, where I falsely stated that the U.S. made it mandatory in 2004. It was actually the EU in 2004 that did. The U.S. wasn't until 2012, so I was only off by eight years. Facts matter, though, so sorry about that and any other blunders that may come up later. You are passionate car people who likely don't see their vehicle as an appliance. It's not a big refrigerator that occasionally gets bird poop on it to us, right? I've been loving the comments, by the way, and I know a little about a lot, and it's great to hear from people who know a lot more than me on a particular topic. The first video of this started off kind of weak, but really blew up. Thanks to all who endured the first one. Now that the record's sort of straight, let's see some other common car features and where they began. One of the first automatics was actually created in the early 1920s by a Canadian named Alfred Horner. It was never sold to the public and used compressed air instead of hydraulic fluid. General Motors in the 1930s started developing what would become the first commercially successful automatic transmission. The first car they sold with it was the 1940 Cadillac and Oldsmobile and it was called a Hydromatic. If you ever saw the movie Grease, the lyrics to Grease Lightning mention this transmission in the beginning. Now I also did some searching and a 1948 Oldsmobile came up as being the first car with a hydromatic. I know civilian car production halted during World War II, so I think it's safe to say for automatics, GM was first and the 1940s is when the public got them. If anyone could clarify, that would be great. Uh, this transmission was a big deal as it allowed easier operation of cars for all and came at the perfect time with a post-World War II economy starting to roll. I personally like rolling my own gears, but I cannot deny how big a deal this feature has become. This is a newer feature and Lexus was the first to have LED low beam headlights in the 2007 LS600H. Audi had the first all LED headlights a few years later on the R8, probably because they knew Tony Stark was going to drive one. LED stands for light emitting diode and were invented by General Electric in 1962. They don't use a filament or gas like halogen or HID lights did. They consume less power, have less heat, and can allow for more creative headlight styles. They also are supposed to last longer and emit a strong light oncoming drivers do not find as blinding. LED headlights are rapidly becoming more common on cars today as the technology has gotten cheaper to produce. was fairly new too, huh? Hardly. In 1956, GM unveiled a Buick Centurion concept car that had a rear camera and small TV in the dash. Pretty forward-thinking stuff. In 1982, Toyota offered a sonar backup system to alert you of objects you might hit on the Corona. This was a small rear-wheel drive car we never got in the U.S. then. The first production car sold with a backup camera was the 1991 Toyota Soarer. If it looks familiar to North Americans, that's because it's a Lexus SC300 or SC400. 
We didn't get the backup camera option then here though. The first car sold in the US with a rear camera was the 2002 Infiniti Q45. Infiniti also offered the first around view camera system for the 2008 EX35. This has cameras uh, mounted front, rear, and on the sides, making parking easier. Backup cameras became mandatory on all cars in the US for the 2018 model year. Even my tiny Miata has an ugly camera right in the middle of the rear bumper. You couldn't mount it anywhere else, Mazda? This is a feature you might not even think about until that dreaded horseshoe looking symbol pops up on your dash. A common tire pressure monitoring system cars use is a sensor mounted in each wheel that monitors tire pressure and sends a wireless signal to the car in real time. There have been other systems that don't use direct sensors in favor of software too. The first car sold with a tire pressure monitoring system was the 1986 Porsche 959. Chevy Corvettes were the first American car with a tire pressure monitoring system in 1991. The Ford Explorer Firestone tire recall led the U.S. government to start the Transportation Recall Enhancement Accountability and Documentation Act, or the TRED Act for short. The Ford and Firestone fiasco was messy as Firestone argued that the Ford had factory tire pressure settings too low and when people didn't check their pressures regularly, got even lower. Ford basically said that no, your tires were defective and the treads could separate. There was documented casualties that led to this recall. A few other vehicles then that had these same tires from the factory were also recalled. Nissan had them on some of the trucks from what I remember. You mainly heard about the Explorers then though, as a ton of them were sold at that time with Firestones. The Tread Act phased in tire pressure monitoring for all non-commercial vehicles sold in the U.S. by 2007. The cassette and the 8-track came out about the same time in the early 60s, but 8-tracks were what was hot in cars. Ford started offering 8-track players for some of their 1966 models. Early cassette tapes had poor sound quality and were mainly used audio-wise for dictation purposes rather than playing music. By the 1970s, cassette technology got a lot better, they were smaller than 8-tracks, and recordable blank tapes were readily available to make the awesome mixtape volume 1 of your dreams. 8-tracks lost the war and cassettes were king by the late 70s. The Sony Walkman, which came out for 1979, was probably the final nail in the coffin for 8-tracks. If you're too young to know what a Walkman is, watch Guardians of the Galaxy. Cassette tapes ruled the 1980s, even though CD players started becoming available on pricier cars, and CDs were taking over in the 90s. The last cars to have a tape deck was the 2010 Lexus SE430, which had one standard, and the 2011 Ford Crown Victoria had it as an option. Turbocharged cars are quite common today. You would think the first production car ones would be on some small engine, a European car, or maybe something from Japan. But General Motors first offered it on two models for 1962. You could get a Chevy Corvair with a turbocharged flat 6 that made it go from 90 horsepower to 150. The other one was the Oldsmobile F85 Jetfire that gave you 215 ponies from a V8. In the 1970s, companies like BMW, Porsche, and Saab started making turbocharged models. It's a great way to get more power from a smaller engine and can give good mileage as it really isn't doing anything if you're just cruising and not on boost. The reliability and performance of turbochargers has gotten much better since the 1970s and 80s. Today, V8s and even some V6s in uh, cars are being replaced by smaller turbocharged four-cylinders. This is another one that's very common in cars today. 
The first one was on the 1986 Buick Riviera. Yeah, it was a green screen, but this is 1986 and I'm sure it impressed your passengers then. The radio controls, climate, and even a trip computer was all adjusted and seen on screen. It even had a graphic title screen that is certainly something new cars tend to do now. It was quite a window into what we would see as common today, and GM put it in the Buick Riata later and the Oldsmobile Toronado. It was dropped after 1992 though. The public just wasn't ready. Maybe they still are not, as some people miss the ease of hitting a physical button for a simple adjustment versus navigating two subscreens to turn on a seat heater. Guess software is cheaper than buttons nowadays. Can your headlights be set to automatically go off of high beam if it senses an oncoming car? I have it myself and it's pretty cool. It's not new tech though. General Motors had a system called the Autronic Eye available for 1952 Cadillacs and Oldsmobiles. It was about a $53 option then, or about $550 today. It looked like an alien periscope coming out of your dashboard to me. Another innovation from General Motors, started in the early 60s uh, with Buicks and Cadillacs, called Twilight Sentinel. This had a sensor that turned on the lights when it gets dark out and leaves them off during the day. You could even set it to keep the lights on up to 90 seconds after the car was shut off. Both of these features are common today. Crossovers are extremely common today and rapidly taking over the market. It's got to be the newest classification of vehicle. Every time you read about another sedan dying off, it's probably because of crossovers. They tend to be car-based tall wagons, basically, and usually offer all-wheel drive, at least optionally. People like these sitting up higher in cargo volume of SUVs, but don't want the poor gas mileage that often comes with those vehicles and don't use the off-road or towing abilities that a traditional SUV can do. So who was first? The 1979 AMC Eagle is what most say. It was based off of a Hornet, but lifted and had four-wheel drive. The term crossover wasn't a thing then and wouldn't be for many years, but the Eagle fits the definition well. The Toyota RAV4 in the 1990s kicked off the current crossover trend, and some makes today, like Buick, only offer crossovers in their lineup. It's a little sad as we have seen quite a few long-running nameplates die off due to crossovers popularity. Automatic climate control is pretty easy to find in cars nowadays. It's nice to set your temperature and forget it, just like in your house. Cadillac is credited as first with their comfort control option in 1964 for only an additional $495. That's $4,200 today. This is a, a little deceptive as air conditioning was still optional and in 1963 the manual AC was only 21 bucks less than the 64's comfort control. Not to get technical, but they accomplished this without microprocessors, which is even more amazing. Lincoln offered one soon after, and by the late 60's, several other brands from GM and Chrysler had it too. Okay, part two is in the bag. I hope you liked it. Please leave a like and subscribe to let me know. Of course, comments will be a welcome sight. So feel free to elaborate on any of them or add some unique trivia on something not listed. Until next time, chatter out.